Last month, the Israeli Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu was interviewed on the Lex Friedman podcast. If you haven't watched the full video, the TLDR is that after this interview, Lex faced a bit of backlash for basically allowing Netanyahu to spin and propagandize with little to no pushback. I don't know if this was because he didn't have the information at hand to do so, or if it was more of a stylistic, let's hear both sides and let the viewers decide kind of thing. For what it's worth, his guest for the following week was an outspoken critic of Netanyahu who accused the Israeli Prime Minister of destroying the foundations of Israeli democracy through their recent judicial reforms. The week after that, he had a two-hour interview with the Palestinian writer Mohammed El Kurd, who definitely has no kind words for the State of Israel. That said, I think it's still fair to say that as a standalone, this interview did come off as a bit of a puff piece. A big problem with talking about Middle Eastern politics in the English-speaking world is that, bluntly, most people just don't care or know enough about it to engage with the topic in a productive way. Sadly, this also makes it the perfect area for hacks and ideologues to get away with pushing incredibly simplified or just flat-out dishonest narratives where the majority of people watching don't have the information needed to effectively challenge them. And I have a feeling that Mr. Netanyahu is aware of this. In this video, I want to talk about one section in particular which I think perfectly captures the dishonesty and propaganda of the Israeli right. The segment begins with Lex asking what the top obstacle is to achieving peace between Israelis and Palestinians. Here is Netanyahu's answer. What is the top obstacle to peaceful coexistence of Israelis and Palestinians? Well, I, I think the reason you have uh, the persistence of the uh, uh, Palestinian-Israeli conflict, which goes back about a century, is the persistent Palestinian refusal to recognize a Jewish state, a nation state for the Jewish people in any boundary. All the factions agree there shouldn't be a Jewish state anywhere, okay? They just disagree between Hamas that says, oh, well, you should have it, you know, we should get rid of it with terror, uh, uh, and the others who say, well, no, we should also use political means to dissolve it. Uh, so that is, that is the problem. So there's a good bit to unpack here. Let's get into it, starting with this initial summary, that there is a persistent Palestinian refusal to recognize a Jewish state in any boundaries. This is one of the more common talking points of the Israeli right, although it isn't completely absent from Israeli liberal discourse either. The gist is that over the years, Israeli leaders have made several good faith efforts at achieving peace with the Palestinians, only to be met with stubborn refusal from people who will accept nothing less than the destruction of Israel. Or to put it in more crude terms. Israel does not want to govern these areas. Israel is not interested in governing millions of Palestinians in the Gaza Strip or in Judea and Samaria. The last thing they want to do is have their soldiers wandering around these dangerous areas or to preside over these areas. All they want, and all Israel has ever wanted, is to separate off from these particular areas and say, listen, you guys rule yourselves. Like, just stop bothering us, please. This, again, is the great lie, is that there is desire for a two-state solution from the Palestinian side. So far, there has been no evidence whatsoever that this is the case. But unfortunately for our two Bennies here, this is not true. They are lying not only about the historical positions of the Palestinian side, but also of their own. When Shapiro says that Israel has only ever wanted to disconnect from Palestine and just be left alone, he's lying about the entire history of Netanyahu's own party. So maybe we should start there. Now, if you've consumed any media at all on Palestine, you've probably heard a lot of references to terrorism. Whether it's the suicide bombings of civilian targets by Hamas, the airport attacks of the PFLP, the numerous shenanigans of the PLO which even quite radical contemporary commentators will openly condemn, what you might not hear so much about is the founding members of Netanyahu's party, Likud. Likud was founded in the early 70s as a merger of Israel's right-wing parties, and in 1977 they won a landslide victory under the leadership of one of their founders, Menachem Begin. And a fun fact about Begin is that he was a terrorist. In the 1940s, he was the commander of a paramilitary organization called the Ergun. And if you want to know what they're all about, you really just have to look at their emblem. You can see there you have a rifle in the middle. On the left, that's a map of mandatory Palestine, which they believe should all belong to the Jewish state. 
And on the right, you have what was called the Emirate of Transjordan, which they also believed should be part of the Jewish state. So really uh, reaching for the stars there. When it became clear that this wasn't going to be the case, the Ergun launched a revolt against the British authorities, most famously with the bombing of the King David Hotel, which killed 91 people. In 1948, during the ethnic cleansing of Palestine, Ergun fighters, in violation of a peace pact, massacred over 100 Palestinian men, women, and children in the village of Deir Yassin. And as a side note, the goals of the Ergun are not a thing of the past. Here is a picture of the Israeli finance minister from the far-right religious Zionist party, who are currently in coalition with Netanyahu. And if you look at the map of what they've called Greater Israel at this recent event, you can see that the ambition has never really died. And especially if you're talking about obstacles to peace, it is worth remembering that some of the biggest ones of the present day are currently the ones propping up Netanyahu's government, but anyway, the reason I bring up Likud is because, despite Netanyahu's claims, this is a party that has consistently opposed efforts to achieve peace with Palestinians. In his first meeting with Jimmy Carter, Begin made his policy outline on this issue very clear. He said, concerning Judea, Samaria, and the Gaza Strip, our position is that we shall not place them under any foreign rule or sovereignty on the basis of two factors. One, our people's right to the land, it is our land as of right, to our national security, which concerns the defensive capability of the state and the lives of our civilian population. When he rejected efforts to include delegates from the Palestinian Liberation Organization in a peace process, he said there is nothing to negotiate with. A Palestinian state in Judea, Samaria, and Gaza is a threat to the existence of the Jewish state. So at this point, we can see how this refusal to accept the other side's existence has gone both ways. At the time Begin made these statements, the PLO and their leader Yasser Arafat were only showing hints that they might be open to recognizing Israel, although their official position was still very much not that. But what Shapiro and Netanyahu don't seem to mention is where this changed. In 1988, at a conference in Geneva, Arafat officially declared his acceptance of the existence of the State of Israel and offered a commitment to peace. This announcement was made at the beginning of the First Intifada, a period of intense protest involving strikes, boycotts, civil disobedience, and a combination of non-violent and violent action. Though Arafat also renounced all forms of terrorism at this point, he made it clear that he didn't have the power to call off the Intifada, which he said would only end if a Palestinian state were established. And since it's going to be relevant later, the First Intifada also saw the birth of a small Islamic militant group called Hamas. As an offshoot of the Egyptian Muslim Brotherhood with support from less than 3% of Palestinians, Hamas rejected the PLO's new position, pledged to obliterate Israel, and establish an Islamic state from the Jordan River to the Mediterranean Sea. With these developments, the PLO had tied its fate to the idea that negotiations with Israel would achieve positive results. If they failed, rejectionist movements like Hamas would be waiting to reap the rewards. Now, for the rest of this timeline, I'm going to skip a lot of details because this is not a comprehensive breakdown of the entire peace process. There's already a very good video out there if you want to see that, link in the description. But this is a video specifically focused on Netanyahu's comments and his own party's role in relation to peace. So if you're annoyed that I didn't spend enough time shitting on Arafat for his support of Saddam Hussein's war in Kuwait and his somewhat snaky behavior around the Madrid conference, or that I didn't shit enough on Ehud Barak for his constant dithering and his infamous assertion that Palestinians are culturally predisposed to lying. Yeah, he did say that. Um, sorry to disappoint you, but I won't be doing that here. Apart from just there as an example. So with Arafat staking his success on negotiations and peace, let's move into the 90s with a series of negotiations known as the Oslo Accords. In 1993, the first Oslo Accords saw the PLO and the State of Israel signing letters of mutual recognition. The PLO recognized the State of Israel, and in turn, Israel recognized the PLO as the representative of Palestinians. In 
In other words, Israel did not recognize a Palestinian state, but instead created a parliament with limited governing powers in the West Bank and Gaza. The idea being that this would serve as a stepping stone to some kind of permanent status negotiation at the end of the decade. Now, despite what Netanyahu says, the Oslo Accords were met with a wave of enthusiasm amongst Palestinians. When they held their first general elections in 1996, Arafat won just under 90% of the vote. And yes, in case you're wondering, these elections were reported to be free and fair by international observers. Hamas, who were just now starting to poll in the double digits, boycotted the elections which they described as the result of an unacceptable compromise with Israel. To them, Arafat was guilty of Uncle Tom behavior and was truly cucked. They didn't say it in that way, obviously. Um, I think the Arabic word would be totbiyah, which means normalization, but uh, you get the idea. In any case, Hamas's participation in these elections would have done little to hurt Arafat's mandate. Now, obviously, these negotiations failed, and there were several reasons for this. One of them would be quite clearly exposed by the second Oslo Accord. The Oslo II Accord in 1995 would see the division of the West Bank into areas A, B, and C. A would see the transfer of civil and security matters from Israel over to the Palestinians. B involved only the transfer of civil powers, and Area C, which makes up about 60% of the West Bank, would remain fully under Israeli control. If you've ever seen those disappearing Palestine maps, now you know how this happened. Go you. The problem with Area C, which would turn out to be a major sticking point in negotiations, was that it held hundreds of Jewish settlements which were illegal under international law. These settlements, which have been growing in the West Bank since 1967, are heavily subsidized by the State of Israel. So when it came to negotiation, the Israelis would insist on annexing, at the very least, the larger settlement blocks. Palestinians, in turn, would demand a one-to-one -one land swap in exchange, and you can probably tell from just looking at this map that this gets kind of messy. And the more the settlements grow, the harder it becomes to remove them, and the harder it becomes to achieve a peace settlement with two states. So, if you've ever wondered why, to this day, you'll occasionally see articles where some politician will say settlements are an obstacle to peace, and then nothing happens, well, now you know. Go you. Why does all this matter? Well, Likud were out of office for most of the Oslo period, but they had nonetheless been championing settlement expansion since the 1970s. Towards the end of Oslo, they did hold power from the summer of 1996 to 99, and lo and behold, those three years were accompanied by reports of an extraordinary increase in settlement construction. I mean, what kind of leader could possibly be in charge of such a flagrant attack on the peace process, especially in a time where Palestinians were more willing to compromise than ever? Who could be responsible for fortifying these widely recognized obstacles to peace? Oh, hi, Ben. So, even as the optimism of the peace process was being embraced by the majority of Palestinians, and as the negotiations were succeeding in keeping Hamas on the sidelines, it's no secret that Likud leaders regarded it with disinterest or even flat out opposed it. And now I think would be a good time to introduce one of Israel's fiercest critics of the peace process, the second founding member of Likud, Ariel Sharon. Now, unlike Begin, Sharon was at the very least not a terrorist. He was, however, a war criminal. In 1982, when Israel invaded Lebanon, the IDF surrounded the Sabra neighborhood and Shatila refugee camp in Beirut and sent in a group of local Christian militiamen under the pretense of rooting out PLO fighters. But the investigations carried out after the event found very little evidence that there were Palestinian militants in the camps. Instead, what they found were the bodies of hundreds, possibly even thousands, of brutally murdered refugees. The IDF had watched the massacre unfold for over 36 hours and done nothing. What they had done was guard the exits to prevent people from fleeing, and they even shot up flares in the night as the phalanges were storming through the camps. Sharon, who was defense minister at the time, knew that the Falanges would likely be out for revenge after the recent assassination of their leader, and that they had massacred Muslims in the past, but still chose to give them free reign over a Palestinian refugee camp. 
An Israeli government investigation found him personally responsible for allowing the massacre to happen, and Sharon was forced to resign. His political career was over. I'm just joking. Sharon would then move on to hold various ministerial positions where he spent the rest of the 80s and early 90s spearheading the expansion of settlements in the West Bank, often in defiance of his own colleagues and the Israeli Supreme Courts. When waves of Jewish immigrants from the former Soviet Union arrived in Israel, Sharon led a program to integrate them throughout Israel and Palestine, where he even created a settlement called Ariel. Very humble. When the Oslo Accords came about, he was the most vocal opponent. By the end of the 90s, when the Oslo Accords had failed to deliver a permanent settlement, Arafat's popularity was quickly declining. Many factions in the PLO started breaking away with Fetah, that's Arafat's party, to join Hamas and their smaller sister organization, Islamic Jihad. In the summer of 99, Netanyahu was replaced by Ehud Barak's alliance of centre-left and centrist parties, but this didn't do much to boost the Palestinians' confidence in the process. Just three months into his government, Barak's housing ministry had already authorised new construction in the settlements, and at a higher rate than the Netanyahu administration that had just been replaced. In the year 2000, after the original timeline for the Oslo Accords had passed, the two leaders, along with Bill Clinton, met at Camp David in a last-ditch effort to rescue the peace process and reach a final settlement. It failed. Again, I won't say too much about this because we're talking about Netanyahu and his party, but just to summarize, if you look at the Wikipedia for this event, the top of the page even says that reports of the summit included multiple witnesses giving contradictory and self-serving interpretations. Unfortunately, a lot of what was said here took place behind closed doors and is very difficult to confirm. Incidentally, a similar complaint has also been made about the Oslo Accords too, but anyway, on the Israeli side, Barack and Clinton both blamed Arafat for the talks failing. I did not have sexual relations with that woman. Oh, shit. Uh, <laughs> how did that get in there? What we do know is over two thirds of Palestinians supported Arafat's positions on the final agreement. And in Israel, the majority believed that Barack had compromised too much. For the Israeli right-wingers today, and probably most of the liberals too, their position is that Barack was a peace dove who offered everything the Palestinians could want, only to be rejected by Arafat who didn't offer a counter-proposal and was really more committed to violence and maximalist demands than to peace. The Palestinian side will generally argue that the offer at Camp David was not at all that generous and in fact, somewhat sus that the offer included Israel retaining control over the Jordan Valley and over Palestinian airspace, a demilitarized Palestinian state with the water resources remaining under Israeli management, and that they had reduced the right of return for Palestinian refugees to a capped figure of 100,000 because any more than that would pose a threat to Israel's Jewish character. Despite the fact that Palestinians offered to consider Israel's demographic concerns and implement the right through a means that could be agreed upon by both sides. The security measures in particular were criticized because they would have effectively made Palestine less than a sovereign state. Now, I am personally more sympathetic to this latter side of the story, you might have guessed, but by this point, the peace negotiations were as good as dead. But not completely. Though Arafat's position in Camp David was supported by Palestinians, the credibility of negotiations was weaker than ever. It definitely didn't help that just before Camp David, the Islamic militants of Hezbollah had successfully forced Israel to end their occupation of southern Lebanon without negotiating at all. The message that was eagerly seized upon by the likes of Hamas was that armed resistance could achieve results where compromise had failed. The buildup of frustration would finally reach a breaking point when Sharon, against the advice of other Israeli leaders, visited the Haram al-Sharif in East Jerusalem. The Haram, also known as the Temple Mount, is seen as the holiest site in Judaism and the third holiest in Islam, and has been a constant venue of intense violence between the two groups since at least 1929. Some people also see it as the biggest obstacle to peace. So, when someone with a reputation like Sharon went there, surrounded by security guards, and said, the Temple Mount is in our hands and will remain in our hands, 
Bearing in mind he also said this just one year after Israel opened a tunnel adjoining the Haram, which caused damage to properties in the Muslim quarter, um, people didn't take too kindly to it. Palestinians and Israeli liberals denounced it as a dangerous provocation and turned out to be all too correct. The visit immediately sparked a wave of riots which eventually spiraled into the second intifada which lasted over four years. Where the first intifada had largely portrayed Palestinians as sympathetic underdogs in the global media, the second intifada achieved the complete opposite. This time, the headlines were dominated by stories of suicide bombings against civilian targets within Israel, the vast majority of which were carried out by Hamas. Especially after 9-11, these images played perfectly into the hands of people who wanted to portray an image of Palestinians that was inseparable from terrorism, despite the fact that the majority of them opposed Hamas's actions. And just for context, this poll is from 2004, after Palestinians had suffered the worst death rate at the hands of Israel since 1967. And on top of that, a majority of them at this point were still supporting the two-state solution. This, again, is the great lie, is that there is desire for a two-state solution from the Palestinian side. So far, there has been no evidence whatsoever that this is the case. Arafat's own role in the Second Intifada is still a subject of debate. Some will go as far as to claim that he secretly organized the uprising himself, although I think that claim is still contested. What isn't contested is that he made no effort to stop it. But that said, the peace negotiations were not over yet. In fact, the peace talks that may have brought both sides closer to a final settlement than any other took place in 2001 at the Taba summit in Egypt. These negotiations primarily involved the division of Jerusalem, a compromise on the future of Palestinian refugees, and the creation of a Palestinian state. But by this point, Arafat was becoming increasingly isolated. He insisted that the package was far from generous, and there was a drawn-out sticking point on the issue of land swaps. Long story short, one-to-one -one land swaps aren't as easy as they sound because not all land is equal. Obviously, if Israel annexes a large settlement area with lots of green space and infrastructure, they can't exactly offer an equally large chunk of desert in exchange, you know, that would be cringe. It was said by the negotiators and by subsequent analysts that these issues could have been resolved with more time, but when Arafat finally accepted the deal, 18 months after the first summit, it was too late. Barack had lost an election to Sharon, who had no interest in resuming talks, and in the US, the Bush administration had sidelined the so-called Clinton-era peace processors for Middle Eastern policymaking and replaced them with neoconservative hawks. Sharon would play into his mutual interests with the United States as both leaders believed themselves to be allies in a war on Arab terrorists. The peace process was over. Over the next couple of years, there would be various proposals put forward. In 2002, there was the Arab Peace Initiative, where Israel was presented with a 10-point proposal in exchange for normalized relations with the Arab League. The initiative was supported by Arafat at the time, and a few years later, it would be given cautious support by the Israeli Prime Minister Ehud Olmert. Although, he did make it very clear that he wouldn't accept any kind of Israeli responsibility for refugees. Full stop, he said. Any refugee coming to Israel. Full stop. Out of the question. I'll never accept a solution that is based on their return to Israel. Any number. <laughs> do, you think he, um, do you think he made his point? Interestingly, Netanyahu once said that he would back the general idea behind this initiative, but then walked it back a year later. And finally, in 2003, there were the Geneva Accords, which had endorsement from Arafat, from Clinton, and even from George Bush. So long as they adhered to the principles to fight off terror, obviously. We must stop the terror. Thank, Thank you. you. Now watch this drive. <laughs> Though Palestinians were more divided on the Accords, the overall package did manage to achieve majority support on both sides in 2004 with the big dent in Palestinian approval consistently coming from the demand for a demilitarized state. Sharon rejected the accords and attacked the left-leaning Israeli politicians and activists involved in it, accusing them of carrying out the activity behind the back of the government and in coordination with the Palestinians. Which 
kind of sounds like a thinly veiled accusation of treason, but just a bit. Now, hopefully that's made a few dents in Netanyahu's version of the story, but honestly, that wasn't even the worst thing he said. Well, they don't want a state next to Israel. They want a state instead of Israel. Uh, and they say, if we get a state, we'll use it as a springboard to destroy the, the smaller Israeli state, which is what happened when Israel unilaterally walked out of Gaza and effectively established a Hamas state there. They didn't say, oh, good, now we have uh, you know, our own territory, our own state. Israel is no longer there. Let's build peace. Let's build uh, uh, you know, uh, economic uh, uh, projects. Let's uh, uh, enfranchise our people. No, they turned it in, into a, basically into a terror bastion from which they fired uh, 10,000 rockets into Israel. So this statement here, I've had a lot of conversations with a lot of crazy people on this topic, but for all the insane things I hear people say about it, this summary from Netanyahu is incredible. Sadly, it's also quite common. The narrative here is that in 2005, when Israel pulled out of Gaza and evacuated 8,000 settlers from the Strip, the Palestinians refused to accept this as a step towards peace and instead used the territory to elect Hamas and establish a terror base. Or, to put it in more crude terms... Okay, in 2006, after Israel withdraws from Gaza, remember Israel's not in control of anything here now, Hamas wins an election. So the first move is not, oh look, Israel wants to make concessions and make peace with us. The first move is, why don't we elect a terrorist group to actually represent us? And the problem is, well, we can just look more closely at Netanyahu's words. Starting with, they didn't say, oh good, now we have our own territory, our own state. Well. Of course they didn't say that, because the Gaza disengagement had nothing to do with establishing a Palestinian state. As he says, the withdrawal from Gaza was unilateral. It wasn't negotiated with the Palestinian Authority. When Sharon presented the plan in a letter to President Bush, he even said, there exists no Palestinian partner with whom to advance peacefully toward a settlement. There was also the other obvious problem that Gaza was only part of the occupation, you know, there's still this whole area to consider, especially given that within a year of Israel taking 8,000 settlers out of Gaza, the settler population of the West Bank increased by about 10,000. Which is awkward. So no shit they didn't say, good, now we have our own state, because they didn't have their own state. Unless they were expecting Gaza to just form its own breakaway state. This little old place? Well, that brings us to the next thing he says here. Specifically, Israel was no longer there, and the implicit suggestion that Palestinians should have just used Gaza to build economic projects. This brings up the question of whether or not the occupation of Gaza ever really ended. The short answer is no. From the disengagement all the way up until the present day, Israel still controls Gaza's airspace, the maritime border, six out of the seven land crossings, the movement of goods and people in and out of the territory, they control a no-buffer zone where people are shot on sight if they try to enter, they have sole control over the Palestinian population registry, the territory is dependent on Israel for electricity, currency, telephone networks, the issuing of IDs and permits for entering and leaving, and it's surrounded by a 7 meter high wall with sensors, remote control machine guns, and barbed wire. After Israel withdraws from Gaza, remember Israel's not in control of anything here now. So if you're a little skeptical of the idea that this was really a sincere effort to advance towards peace, let's look at some of the other possible reasons they had for doing this. And maybe we can also see if we can find any more obstacles to peace along the way. The most obvious reason for the pullout if we're going by the words of people close to Sharon, is concern over demographics. Gaza is a very small area, holding around 2 million Palestinians on just over 350 square kilometers of land. If it were its own country, it would be the third most densely populated in the world, meaning there was very little room for expanding settlements. As the peace process failed, the Likud politician Ehud Olmert argued that the Palestinian struggle was quickly changing from a struggle against occupation to a struggle for one man, one vote. The idea of bringing two million Gazans into an Israeli state and giving them voting rights would have radically shifted Israel's demographics and in Olmert's words would mean the end of the Jewish state. 
the policy instead would have to be a unilateral solution to maximize the number of Jews and to minimize the number of Palestinians. This, he said, was the only answer to the demographic danger. A year later, Sharon's government introduced the disengagement plan. He originally wanted to call it the separation plan, but then changed it after realizing that separation sounded bad because it was similar to apartheid. <laughs> you can't make that up, can you? In his speech, given on the first day of the disengagement, he gave a strong hint towards the demographic concerns by saying, we cannot hold on to Gaza forever. More than a million Palestinians live there and double their number with each generation. The disengagement involved the evacuation of all 21 settlements in Gaza and an additional four in the West Bank, where they also placed a ban on settlers re-entering the area. Take a note on those four settlements in the West Bank, by the way. They're going to come back later. There is dispute over whether or not this was intentional, but one result of the pullout was that it royally fucked the chances of future peace negotiations and also served as free propaganda for Hamas. Because it was actioned unilaterally and without coordination from the Palestinians, there was no way to organize a smooth transition of land and resources. When Netanyahu talks about Palestinians not building economic projects with their new state, he's almost definitely alluding to the story of the greenhouses which Palestinians supposedly destroyed as soon as the Israelis left. Hamas, a terrorist group, immediately rushed in and burned everything. They burned the greenhouses, they burned all the Jewish houses, they knocked down all the good infrastructure, and then they just took over the place. But unfortunately for Ben number two here, that is not true. The greenhouses were intended to be handed over to the Palestinians, but without any coordination, there were a few problems. Namely, that at least half of the greenhouses were actually destroyed by settlers before they left. As for the other half, the withdrawal itself had left a security vacuum, where the remaining greenhouses were looted by Palestinians for two days before the PA could restore order. Although even there, it seems like the looters left the greenhouses themselves structurally intact, so still lying, Ben. Whether it was intentional or not, the fact that Sharon did this without consultation made the Palestinian Authority and their new leader, Mahmoud Abbas, look completely impotent. After over a decade of failed peace talks, this unilateral action was the last nail in the coffin for negotiations. Hamas, on the other hand, completely spun the event in their favor, claiming that four years of violent resistance had achieved more than 10 years of negotiations. A survey from that year found that a plurality of Palestinians agreed with them. The optimism of the peace process, that had served as a barrier between Hamas and the Palestinian people for over a decade, had broken down. And at all stages, that barrier was slowly hacked away at at least in part, by the party that Netanyahu still leads to this day. And just as a closing point, if you remember those four West Bank settlements that were dismantled in 2005, the ones that Sharon said Israel would not be able to keep in a future agreement with Palestinians, it's strange that Netanyahu would talk about this event as if it was an honest attempt to advance peace. Because if he really believed that, why did his government repeal the act that banned settlers from those areas just this year? Kind of told on himself there a little. Yeah. <laughs>